giving you a voice, making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the fun. fun. First updates now, FTC is produced in partnership with the Orange Alliance. Now FTC is a platform to keep up to date on live and archive first tech challenge events and team stats at theorangealliance.org. And by viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Welcome to FTC Recap. Tonight we will be recapping four key FTC regions and events that have occurred this December. We know we'll be talking about FTC in Mexico. Ethan will be talking about the West Virginia State Tournament. Shishir will be discussing some events in Washington. And I will be breaking down the, F the Michigan FTC State Tournament. Uh, we are sorry in advance if we do not talk about your event or robots. We have a lot of events to cover and say we're just covering some highlighted and key events in FTC. We will do another big recap like we did two weeks ago uh, next month. Reporting for FTC Recap, I'm Nathan. If you guys have any questions that you'd like to be read during the show, please tag at First Updates Now and type your question into the chat. I'm Ethan, reporting for, from Southeast Iowa. Hey there, guys. I'm Shashir. I'm reporting from Portland. And I'm at Lino, and I'm reporting from Mexico. Anyways, I think we get started with Mexico. So for this year, Mexico has grown a lot. We have around 40 teams in total that participate in FTC in Mexico. Um, this is due to Mexico deciding to add regionals to the event. So let me just give you a small, um, explain to you guys how it works. So it's basically two regionals and then the teams that um, qualify, they go to a national tournament in Mexico City, which will be taking place in January. I think it's January 19. And well, we already had our two regional events, so we're just going to talk a little bit about them so you guys know which teams from Mexico have been highlighting so far. So the first regional we had was on December the 1st, where we had 70 te 17 teams participating in Monterrey, Mexico. Um, there were the elimination matches actually were really tough. Uh, every single match actually went to a rubber match. And finally, after some close matches, um, the alliance, which actually didn't climb, which was 13-5-31, the Bot Busters, with their alliance partners 15-6-0-0, Cerbotics, took the gold. And also a big shout out on that event to 68-72, CP Bots, who won the Inspire. Overall, um, they did a great job, and actually those were the number one alliance captain. Um, and well, the other event we had was the 15th of December, which was the center zone regional in Toluca, Mexico. This was a really interesting regional because we had 26 teams, but guess what? We only had four veteran teams. So that means we had like, I think it's 22 rookie teams on one event. So a lot of rookie teams. And aside from the other um, event, the playoffs actually went um, full power for the number one alliance that being 83-27, the Spartans um, did a consistent climb every match. And with 15-9-12, they had this really simple mechanism and claw that could control the cubes and score. They were scoring around six to seven cubes per match. Um, that's actually a lot in Mexico. We still have a lot to go for level of play of robots. And big surprises at the award ceremony as uh, one of the big teams, 3141, the Bears. Um, some of you guys may know them as the Inspire winners from 2014. Um, they actually didn't qualify to nationals. So I'm not sure if they're actually playing somewhere else after this event. And also a big surprise as rookie team 15935. Don Pink took the Inspire Award with their great team performance at the event. The next event in Mexico is the national competition at Mexico City. And we can expect, um, I think that it's going to be a competitive event and probably the most competitive event of FTC we've ever seen, just due to the reason that it's not going to be the first event for any team in Mexico. And we're going to have big names like the Cerbotics, the Bud Busters, the Spartans, and CP Buds, and also Bud Regos Jr., which Bud Regos Jr. is actually the team which was representing Mexico in first global. So they will be there looking to punch their ticket to championship. Wow, and nice. Awesome. Oh, Sorry, go ahead. Um, okay, so it's cool that a rookie team run one Inspire. Um, yeah. That's like fairly common. It really has become, 
I think it, that that uh, that trend has become really common. Last year, for example, the Oregon State winners and the Washington State winners of Inspire, I know for facts, were rookies. And um, like before, we really saw this bridge. We we really saw this gap. <clears throat> And the level of play was almost inspire, you know, like almost impossible for like uh, rookie teams to win the Inspire Award. But I think as we like move on in FTC, we're noticing there's a higher and higher turnover rate, which is like like paving the way for these teams without much experience to be able to get such prestigious awards. Yeah, like it, for example, here in Mexico, it's probably like the first time in a while that the rookie team takes the Inspire. So it was really shocking for many teams, especially the veteran teams, like the four veteran teams. Everyone was like, it's going to be one of those four. And when the rookie team actually took it, everyone was like, wow, they have a lot, like the team. Uh, Lino, do you know how many teams advance from nationals to worlds? Okay, that's actually a really interesting question and a topic I wanted to talk about because um, do you know how many teams advanced from nationals to championships last year? No, it was one team. So it was only the Inspire Award winner. Um, why is that? That's probably because um, the way I, I hear it um, first, that's it, I'm actually not sure, is that depending on how many teams per region they have, it's the number of, of slots they make for the for the for the championship and last year in mexico we had like 12 to 15 teams it was actually a national championship which um it was kind of like actually like teams only had like four matches to play and, and that was it so like it all went really fast and at the end well the the rules say that if there's only like one pass that only the inspire award winner gets it but yeah. like there's been years in mexico which there's only like two passes to champs. So we got the winner Alliance captain taking the, taking the pass. And then we, well, the other robot doesn't, doesn't actually like make it to champs, which it kind of sucks, but I'm hoping this year, especially because we are getting lots of new teams in Mexico and we have a bigger community that first will give us more passes at, at least three so that there's like a, the inspire and the two robots that will be win the national event yeah and also um first chance is expanding right from 128 to 160 teams and that expansion is in the uh that that that's in the like in the realm of like the the international teams as well so i think that 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 could also help uh, help out quite a bit well just to touch on that it's a expansion because wow. I say expansion because we're if you look at the number of teams advancing to super regionals then super regionals to worlds, the US state if the number of international teams stays the same, every US state, the number of international teams and the number of uh, lottery teams they say US states will each lose still, even though there was an expansion. That's right, but we're talking about Mexico, which is yeah, international. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, it just it'll be interesting to see. I definitely would hope that regions like Mexico, Canada can um, can definitely uh, get more slots yeah, because it's definitely probably get more slots. important to um, it's important for international teams to be at championship and to kind of represent there. I'd be yeah. curious to see how many spots like Romania has. I know they've got a good handful of teams. Like, for example, um, let me just give you a year, for example, 2016. Um, there were like two championship spots only. And honestly, um, um, the best robot in Mexico wasn't a champs. Um, I'm just going to say it the way I saw it. Like, um, not, it wasn't the best robot. Like, maybe um, it was Inspire one and, like, maybe the winning alliance. But honestly, like if we put the robots in single performance, there there was like a team, I think it was Bud Regas, which had a great robot and they almost like um, solo carried the finals. Like they, they, I think they took it to a rubber match and then like um, they they almost beat the, the Alliance by itself because 31-41 um, actually didn't move on finals. Um, they, 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 they didn't make it to champs. So wh what I'm hoping if we get more championships a lot is that the best robots always pass because um, at the end, I, I want the region to show that there is some competitive level here. Yeah, that is one thing I've noticed with international a bit. It's that unfortunately, um, the way that things work out, uh, 
it's oftentimes not the best. Uh, it's not. It's just not the best teams that make it out, and that's very disappointing. Um, but I'm. I really, really would love to see more international representation. I think that will be so cool, um, because like even though it's the World Championship, we all like we all like everyone thinks like everyone more or less knows that it's it's U.S. dominated. I really want to see that go. I really want to see that change in the FTC level. Yeah, and there's like that dynamic that I'll talk about more in a second with only two slots to advance further because as as an alliance captain you have to say no or you give up your slot at advancing so you lose that dynamic of having two really strong teams on alliance and you kind of have to break everyone up there, there's actually a the story about that uh, um about 31 41 burst um they were um, I think they were like ranked number three or something like that. And they, they, they everyone knew that whoever picked them won the event. So I think they were like Alliance captain number four or something like that. So what happened was Alliance one picked them. And of course they said no. And everyone was like, wait, what? Do you don't want like the best robots together or what? And like it got into, it got to the point that it, everyone just started joking at the line selection about picking 3141. And so number two, ca- <laughs> number two captain just said, as a joke, yeah, I'll pick 3141. And it was just like, ha, 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 ha. but they don't want to <laughs> get picked. And it actually, it didn't get, get, gave a good environment from what I heard. So I, I, I really do think that there should be at least three, three slots for the future. Yeah, that's one thing I remember I competed in Idaho a few years back and like there's just no way um, even we, we saw the last year like I think one of the tournaments Vermont I believe where um, gluten free and brainstormers couldn't be together because once again two advancement slots um, even la- even Idaho which is like it, where they have three advancement slots but like Redneck Robotics was unwilling to partner with the number one seed because they were unsure of getting their advancement slot all of these types of things it's really uh, you gotta be, we have to be careful and I think I think that really shows a fundamental flaw of the FTC advancement system as a whole. But it really, um, I think, I think uh, getting more slots is always better in terms of in terms of these competitions because it allows for more collaboration. And at the end, isn't that what what this is about? What the program is about? It's yeah, about making a community. Um, I definitely agree with you. And to answer Diego's question, there was only one team that went from Mexico to Worlds last year, so we have no we have no idea right now uh, about this year. I don't know if first has. Re- it, First might not have released exactly how many are going from each state or the state APs or region eight affiliate partners haven't released that as um, Alex from TOA pointed. Yeah. Michigan was down six slots this year from 19 to 13 at their um, state championship. And I definitely think first should be uh, increasing the size of uh, the world championships that every state can, I think at least advance six. Yeah, I think six teams would be all three Inspire winners and then everyone on the winning alliance captain, or everyone on the winning alliance. Um, because I think if you win the event and if you win the Inspire, there is no reason why you shouldn't go. And the, I think the minimum should be six instead of the minimum being, I'd say, I think it's two because I know West Virginia had two. Yeah, here's the random fact also, it's, uh, Nathan. Um, we actually don't have like second and third place from the Inspire here in Mexico. Uh-huh. I don't know if we will have any nationals this year, but from what I've heard before, um, like at least on, on regionals this time, we didn't have second and third place. Interesting. So, and I know Massachusetts yeah. says that too, but they just don't have award nominations. Mm-hmm. And I guess they can do that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Afria? I don't know how to say that. Afera. Afera asks, um, what do you guys think of doing a system like the FRC district ranking system for advancement? So for you guys who don't know, FRC districts are all based on points. So you get X amount of points for winning every match or in a limbs and qualification matches, and then you get points for winning awards. So it it rewards teams who are really strong at awards and robot performance. Yes, so I'm not... Sorry, I, I just answered because he said, can I ask Nathan? But everyone should respond. Um, I'm not sure how that would work. I feel like that would work in a state like Michigan or in a state like Illinois or Iowa or I'm trying to think of other huge states. Maybe California, if they weren't split up into regions, same with New York, if they weren't split up into regions where you've got a lot of teams. 
but that wouldn't work in like Mexico where there's what 50 teams, 40 teams, something like that. There's like, okay, so let's add them up. Like there was 17 in one event and 28 in the other. I think there's like 35 or 35 teams. I don't think that would work in a 35 team state. So no, no, it doesn't work. Like honestly, mm, for Mexico, as I would say, um, it has to be the best robot because um, I'm more of like the always represent with the best robot. Um, I'm more of like a robot guy than an art guy. So in my personal opinion, I prefer that the best robot goes to Mexico to compete at what we call the robotics championship, you know? Yeah. That's true. I think that it really requires that you really need that representation, I feel, right? And that that you get the best representation with that best robot. Um, Personally, for me, like my opinion on this is that um, it has positives and uh, negatives. The good thing about it is that in the district ranking system, a robot performance is weighed way, way higher than awards, right? And I personally like that as like a robot-centric team and as like as as what I believe, um, like first should stand for, I think that it, wait, putting that much weight on the robot centric aspect is better, is good, right? But then again, it becomes way, way too complicated. I feel like this is that's just it's just impossible to do this. Um, I mean, sure, you can you can get you can you can rank, but like I I think that. I think that it'll require a major overhaul of the way that things work um, in in the system as is. So I think, I mean, I think it could work possibly, but I think it requires a lot more, um, a lot more infrastructure than what is currently available for FTC teams. And I, I don't want to get too candidly speaking here, but I definitely think that one of the yeah, biggest flaws in FTC is that the best robots from tournaments, from state championships, don't typically advance looking at West Virginia that happened probably in Mexico too. Um, I think first definitely needs to majorly expand the world championship. And I wouldn't mind a world championship with 300 FTC teams at each. It's just a lot more competition to play against a lot more opportunities for teams to go to worlds. And frankly, you're going to have a lot better finals and playoffs because there's just so many more teams there. Um, I would say, I, I still don't know how I feel about awards. Um, awards are important, but, at the same time, I feel like to an extent, first masks FTC as a robotics tournament, but it's more of a awards and businessy tournament. It's more uh, similar to to FLL in that aspect than it is FRC, right? Totally, Very yeah. Much so. uh, not something I uh, necessarily need to get into right now. And I guess this interesting question that Afera asked is, uh, would you want super regionals back uh, if they expanded? Hmm. Personally, I'll speak on this because I thought of this. If they go back to one champs, absolutely. But with the current system, it just doesn't make sense. Like, if, no. I'd say if we had one champs with 400 FTC teams, so that would be another 100 and that'd be another 80 from what we have now. Four okay. champs with 400 FTC teams um, totally bring back supers. Super regionals, my one time I went to super regionals, still the best competition in the world because it's almost like a state tournament or like a world championship, but it's all about FTC. And the, from my one experience at Worlds doing FRC, F, no one cared about FTC. So, I don't know. That's right, that's right. Is there like, I'm actually curious this because like, um, I haven't joined the international FTC community until like last year. So is there like an ROI of, of FTC? Um, well, that is considered like MTI, which is like, a, it's it's a tournament that happens in Maryland, I think. It's it's somewhat like it, um, but unfortunately, it's not very central like IRI is because it's in Maryland, which is like East Coast, extreme East Coast. And another thing is that you do have to apply, uh, at least this is what deterred my team, is you have to apply before Worlds. Um, so that's right. Like, yeah. So, yeah. I guess I'll plug my own event here. My oh, team for go. our second year in a row is hosting the Chicago Robotics Invitational, which we kind of are kind of trying to based off of IRI, you do still have to apply, but you don't have to apply before world championships. You have to apply probably by the end of May. I don't know. I have to make that decision soon. Um, but yeah, we have a 36 team max as I think that's the, that's a different thing with FTC. You know, is <clears throat> 36 team max is the max for regionals. I guess if we really wanted to, we could run a dual division, uh, 44 team event or 48 team event but that's just a lot of teams for one school yeah. um 
so no, there isn't an FTC IRI right now, or FTC equivalent, MTI kind of, but as you said, it's not very central. Uh, so check back in a few years. And one oh. quick thing, chat saying that there is an FTC IRI. First of all, there was <laughs> one, I think, in Velocity Vortex. Second of all, like, not really. They're, they don't, I think when we're talking about IRI, we're talking about the caliber of IRI, not the event of IRI. And yeah. I don't think there's, there's any kind of, uh, like, that caliber event other than MTI or Chicago Robotics Invitational. Yeah, um, that really uh, just to jump in, somebody who's the MC of the FRC IRI, it is definitely not the same. It's a very different environment uh, when they ran uh, IRI FTC. Still a good event, don't get me wrong, but totally different environment than what FRC IRI is. Definitely, definitely. So speaking of 36 team events, uh, let's move into West Virginia. All right. So I'm going to jump in pretty in depth about one match in sp specifically. But first, a little background on West Virginia. So they have 11 native teams, but they hold a whole state championship with two slots. And one of the reasons that this is an event that I am incredibly interested in every year is because it's one of the few events that still prioritizes the people who get into it by who signed up first. So a lot of times, really good teams all get into it. And it's also pretty central in the East region where there are a ton of good teams. So this becomes an early slot, an early event where really good teams can go and try to get one of the two advancement slots to last year ESR, this year Worlds. So a team who does get one of these slots has qualified for Worlds in June, or sorry, in December. So they have like five months to just work on the robot and not worry about advancing which is a huge advantage because all of a sudden you're only worried about how you perform at Worlds and you can structure your season a lot more about around that. So West Virginia becomes this kind of bloodbath of just whoever can afford to go and then whoever can be competitive in December. And it sets the trend for FTC games almost every year. And this year I don't think was any different. So the notable teams at West Virginia, we had two Wisconsin teams, which was a drive. We have 8680, Crack and Pinnon, a finalist alliance from the Ochoa Division of Worlds. They were the first pick, and one of like five or seven teams who could double Cypher, double Relic in actual matches, which was insane to watch. And like, if you didn't know who 8680 was last year, eh. <laughs> you didn't compete last year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other Wisconsin team that got in was 4106, the Supposable Thumbs. They were the fourth ranked Alliance captain in Ochoa at the Detroit Worlds last year. And they were also the Inspire Award winner from West Virginia last year. So they were one of the two teams to advance. They actually went to ESR instead of their home Super Regionals. Hey, Ohio. Ethan, I, I want to ask real quick, like, yeah. how, somebody who's not an FTC, how are these teams able to, like, travel from Wisconsin and Ohio and stuff to go to West Virginia to compete? Like, why is that allowed? I don't know. Um, it's kind of just always been this way. Um, it's just like open border, so to speak. You can you can actually compete. So I could go to Texas and compete if I wanted to? It's Texas, all depending on if the state is open. So one of the reasons that West Virginia is like this is because it's one of the few states who is open to non-border states and doesn't prioritize other states which are also open. So That's like right. Ohio. So basically, the way that the way that we work is we have uh, FTC either has open or closed borders. I know that Oregon's closed. Like the bigger states are generally closed, right? I know Oregon's yeah. closed, Washington's closed, <laughs> Michigan's um, like, closed, no one closed. closed. There you go. Ohio's uh, but, um, closed, sort of. Mm -hmm. But the smaller states, the states with less of a program, um, for example, the main one would be Idaho and I believe also Utah in, in my region, the ones that I'm familiar with. Those are open. So teams from uh, from like elsewhere, from other states can actually enter those competitions as long as they sign up. Uh, I'm not sure about how they prioritize. It's all uh, dependent on the uh, affiliate partner of that region. But basically by doing that, they allow teams for, to, from all over to come in. It has both like advantages and disadvantages. The good thing is that like in-state teams can have a lot of exposure to like out of state competition like they can have exposure to what the rest of the world is doing or the rest of the region is doing but the problem is um, because these are generally smaller regions these in-state teams generally tend to get trampled um, they get absolutely destroyed by the teams that come in um, simply because like they just don't have as much experience like it, it is a exactly like a double-edged sword right so um, I think that like having this open versus closed border is good uh, in some instances but 
I, it can also be bad for these teams that um, that really do want to advance, but they don't have the resources to do so um, out of state. My yeah, biggest um, gripe with it is that it isn't consistent. Like Nebraska has 19 teams and has a closed state championship with two slots. And that's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not um, super happy about that because I can't go to Nebraska now. Yeah, it's interesting. And I guess one of the main reasons I guess to answer your question, Tyler, and to others who might not know is, I always like bigger states like Illinois, Michigan doesn't do this, but some big states do this like Illinois and Iowa, uh, notably, is we have league meets. So as I said right before pre-show, I've been to I've been to five league meets so far this year. And that's just at a bunch of local high schools in Chicago where we every team plays five matches and then that's the end of the day. And then actually in a month and a half, um, we do championships where they just go to the local high school. So if a team was in like I don't know, Wisconsin, who wanted to come to a league meet in Illinois, they would have to like drive in to the, like the city of Chicago or to the suburbs of Chicago to go to a different high school every single time. Yeah, yeah. so it's kind of like a parallel between FRC districts almost and traditional yeah. events and this. Like it's not exactly the same, but there's some sort of parallels around there. So that makes sense. Thank you. It's very mini districts. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yes. That's Cruz. So back on Ohio, Ohio is one of the states in FTC who's good every single year like for as long as I can remember from Ohio this year, we had 50, 40, who is the world's Ochoa division finalist Alliance captain. There you go. We had 50, 29, the power stackers, the division finalist second pick from the other division at Detroit. We had a one Oh, Oh, three Oh seven Sigma who was a um, motivate award nomination and the winning Alliance captain from West Virginia last year. And we also had one Oh, four, six, four, I always mess that up. <laughs> the Bionic Tigers, who were a sister team of 5040. So we had a big notable showing from Ohio, which happens pretty much every year with West Virginia because they're very close. We also, also other notable teams, we had South Super Regionals finalist captain 8417 Electric Legends from Kentucky and 8645 the Robotic Doges, the Edison Division finalist alliance captain from last year. So just looking at this tournament, there are so many division finalist alliance from Worlds. <laughs> it's it's crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> this was a very competitive tournament, as mm -hmm. everyone in the chat should probably know. A lot of the big name teams in FTC uh, were there. I mean, some notable absences were like Redneck. I'm not surprised that they didn't go. Same with uh, Land Bros or uh, Gluten Free. Uh, a lot of the Super East teams don't really normally come down. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of that like lower east area. So going to the line selections, we had two really stacked alliances. We had the number first, the wonder, well, the first seed, which was captained by 5040, their first pick, 4106, the supposable thumbs, and six, second pick of 15116, nerds. So an interesting thing about them is they were not a mineral scorer. They just did auto and hang. And as a first seed, second pick, that's odd. Um, because there were second picks who did score minerals. Uh, notably, the second pick of the, of the third alliance, which was captained by 8680, Crack and Pinnon, and their first pick, 7 Sigma 10030. Their second pick was the Robotic Doges, who we talked about earlier, and they could score minerals. So it's interesting that they kind of fell through there. Watching it live, I was set on 8680 winning this event. Like their alliance looked great. They really felt like it was their event to lose. Um, they were the alliance captain of their alliance. So they were set up to advance to worlds if they hit it. And if they missed, they have to go to another two slot state championship to event, which was their home championship. So a bit of a spoiler alert, 8680 lost West Virginia. They won the first match by just over 100 points because the Red Alliance, captained by 50-40, played their Alliance captain and their second pick, which is kind of a strategy that counts on losing the first match and then is an almost guaranteed win for the second match because in the second match you're playing your captain again and first pick against their captain and second pick. And then everything kind of comes down to the third match. This was a little different. The second match was only decided by six points. And the Red Alliance 
took it back. And then the third match was decided by 50 points because I believe 8680's lift was still broken. And Red ended up taking this set. So what gives? What did 8680 do wrong? So the biggest thing was that their lift broke. And if you just look at that on its face, then it seems really obvious why they lost. But because the second match was only decided by six points, I think there's a lot more to it than that. So watching Autonomous, both teams hit their samples. It looks like both alliances get two markers. But it's hard to tell for red. And then 80, uh, 8645 stays in their depot and doesn't park. And 8680 does park. So all of a sudden, if Group Doge's 8645 parked, they won that match. But We'll keep going. So as driver controlled starts, we have, let's see, if you can roll for, you can hit play. So we see 8680 starts to intake over in the far blue corner and drives back over here. And right here, you can see their lift kind of struggling to go up and it just ends up being stuck. So you can roll and see what they do with this. So they kind of aren't really sure what to do and start to drive over to the red side. This is the first place that I think they made a pretty interesting mistake. Um, firstly, that was some sketchy defense if they actually play defense there because they'd be playing defense on a team who was in their landing zone. And it kind of lost some time for them. So the next thing they do is over in the red depot, they're extending their intake, excuse me, the red crater, and are kind of getting in 4106's way a lot. And that's their strategy of playing defense with their intake. And they do this for a long time and just kind of get in thumbs way for about 30 seconds. Here, if we could pause, I think is where the second thing that they missed that was really big is they still have their intake right there. 4106 isn't anymore trying to intake. They're back scoring. And 8680 isn't really doing anything with that time. Because this match is so close, if they score three minerals into the depot, <coughs> they would tie. Yeah. Another interesting option could have been using their extending intake, which is a lot faster, is grabbing minerals and then spinning them out for 84 or 8645 to then grab and score in the, into the lander. So we can hit play again. We see 4106 scoring into their lander, scoring a couple of minerals, and 8680 still there, and in their way a lot. And I don't really want to talk about how legal that is, because I don't think there's a lot to learn from that discussion, really. So then you see 8680 getting some, grabbing some minerals and dumping them out for 8645 to score a little later in the match. And that gives them like a five-point swing way at the end of the match. So 8680, working on intaking again, thumbs going to, looks like they were intaking, but now trying to transfer. And everyone kind of lining up for their hangs. You can see over on blue, Doges get one of their minerals and score the other one into the blue or red alliance's silver cargo hold. So they lose five points there. It's a really close match, which is why I think it's so interesting. Um, you can see everybody basically just goes to hang. And it's a very interesting match because of how close it was and because of some interesting defensive plays that 8680 did. I am impressed that they recovered so quickly from their lift breaking. Like it was almost immediately they said, okay, this is the problem. Let's just go play defense. Where I think it's a really interesting discussion is do you guys think they should have played D sets or would their time have been better spent scoring into the depot or feeding minerals into doges? Yeah. So I'm going to just jump in because I have a huge long email chain from <laughs> one of the teams on the red Alliance. Uh, Shishir and Ethan will definitely remember this from last week. And I've actually, my notes from an interview I did over the phone with uh, one of the 8680 coaches and drivers. Um, so the biggest thing is their lift broke. So they really were stuck. They couldn't do anything. And as their driver said that they were 
trying to play uh, what they believed was legal defense. And as you said, I don't want to sit here and argue whether this was legal or not. Um, Let's not talk about that. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and that. right here is, uh, or we'll see when 8680 swings around and jumps right in, almost like jumps into the crater and it like bends. The robot, I guess, did get a little uh, entangled. We're going to see it happen right now. Um, I guess robots did get a little entangled, but that wasn't really their intention. I guess 8680 did get a warning for their, uh, some could say aggressive defense. Um, and they didn't really do that in the next match. Uh, or was there a next match? I can't, no, there wasn't, yes. right? There was. There was. There was. Yeah, um, they didn't do it in the next match, uh, according to their drivers. So, I mean, I think it was a smart strategy. Actually, we're going to see this in one of the Michigan matches in a few minutes. And then. Yeah, I'll go on my rant later because um, <laughs> everyone hates defense and it annoys me. Um, but I think if you really can't do anything, why not play defense? FTC teams are scared of defense, but it's defense wins champions, championships. Um, at least in football, it does. Um, I don't know about FTC, but I think it's I think it's fun to see them play defense and try their best to. Uh, defend uh, disposable thumbs and do what they can with a robot that doesn't really work. I mean, they could have scored in the depot, but at that point, I'm guessing the drivers are just thinking, we got to stop them. We got to stop them. They're not really thinking about those two points. It's probably not something they really like practice throughout the season. Okay. So I'm just going to jump in and say um, there was a lot of difference, especially in the North zone regionally in Mexico. Um, but it was, it's not like the difference you guys are expecting, like defending the crater. They're defending each other's depots because that's where all the points were. So there was like, I, I don't have a video right now, but maybe in the future I can get you guys a video. There was like a lot of difference being played in elimination matches because like basically for the, for elimination matches on, on Mexico Reynolds, many of the matches were just like um, deep at scored um, minerals. So it got to lots of strategies, which were really interesting. Jasir, what do you think? Uh, I, I don't know. I think I think it's it's interesting the way that the match was played out, that's for sure. But I can't really comment on whether which strategy would be better because to be honest, like what if what if the what if uh, the, the lack of crack opinions defense would have meant that the red alliance scored more minerals, right? Like if they had scored one more mineral the depot like would would be next to useless. So there really is a give and take. And I personally have absolutely no clue where that give and take, where like the, the peak of that is. But <clears throat> I think for what, what these guys had, the situation they were dealt, um, they did a really good job of it. So um good cool, good good job, Crack Infinian, I guess, is where I'm gonna end up at, where I'm gonna um keep my perspective. <clears throat> so yeah, yeah. Sure. and going over a little bit of the awards um, 10301, the Inspire Award, so they're qualified to Worlds, and then 5040 was the winning Alliance captain, so they have another ticket. So that'll make Ohio States really interesting because 5040 is really huge in Ohio. So I'm interested to see how that ends up affecting their state championship, which is in a couple months, I believe. So Igor, Igor Robotics says they could have done a bit of both. This is how. 724 has won in the past. And I agree. I think that's about what I think would have won them the match is like that first 10 seconds when they drive over and try to play some defense in the red half of the field. If they had scored in the depot there, I think that could have decided them the match. And they figured this out the second time, but the first time that 4106 ran a cycle and scored, they just sat in the crater. Um, those are the big two places that I think 8680 could have capitalized some of the, on some of that time. But um, I do have to disagree with that comment, saying that this is how 724 has won in the past. Um, 724, when their primary scoring mechanism was completely like not working, which was, I believe, in semifinals of last year's World Championship, I don't remember them scoring anything. I remember them simply playing very, very effective defense. Um <clears throat> And I believe that was what played a key part in them winning that match. But um, definitely, I, I do agree that um, a combination could have been uh, could have been more effective. But then again, when you're driving like in the heat of competition, it's very hard to have that have that frame of reference, frame of mind to be able to um, switch between these two equally important and equally valid strategies. Mm -hmm. 
So Adam from 14875 said, I'm not sure if this is the right decision, but I think that scoring the depot was best, but I will say that their defense was pretty effective. Yeah, that seems about right. Yeah, that, that seems that they, <laughs> they hit it on the head, honestly. They, they did, I think they got it right. Um, uh, pre pretty, pretty good, yeah. And yeah. finally, uh, Island, Elon, uh, sorry, I-L-A-N-9421. Uh, they, they commented, I think the rules are the rules, and if the rules allow it, um, it shouldn't be a controversy every time a team uses it. And I think that's, um, that's very valid as well. I think that, that really um, that can be said for many of the competitions, um, not just this year, but in years past as well. Uh -huh. And kind of a counterpoint, turbocharged 14615 said, I think teams should just play the game. Yeah, there you go too. I mean, I yeah, I believe the rules are the are part of the game, right? So that there that that does that makes a lot of sense. I think that um, teams shouldn't shouldn't try to bend the rules. <laughs> uh, I don't think teams should try to bend the rules in their favor, but I uh, but at the same time, I don't think they should shy away from things that are allowed simply because they feel like it. It's not the. It's not. It won't be perceived well. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I yes. agree with you, Shishir. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So um, I think it's uh, it's time to move into the next region. Uh, we're gonna go into Washington. So um, just this past week, um, so basically, uh, just this past weekend was the weekend of interleague tournaments. Um, uh, in in Washington, um, in Washington there were actually five ILTs, and it was a doozy. We had some very strong showings from many teams, but unfortunately, some really heavy hitters um, didn't make the cut. So let's get into it. Okay. Um, so starting off, um, starting off, let's get into the Tesla Interleague Tournament, arguably the most well-known of the five. Um, here, we had Team 8103 Null Robotics uh, clinch the first seat and pick Teams 11138 Robo Eclipse and 11104 The Bearded Pineapples. On the second seat, we had the Captain 8923 Perpetual Velocity pick their sister team, I believe, 6220 Centripetal and 7330 Overlake FTC. These two teams made it to the finals, um, these two alliances, but and the second seed actually was able to take it to a rubber match, but unfortunately lost that rubber match by just 10 points to the dominant number one seed. In addition to this, the Inspire Award winners were Team 6220 Centripetal, 417 Skid, Space Koalas in Disguise, and 11138 Robo Eclipse. Congratulations to these teams. So I want to just go back into this match uh, a, a little bit. As you can see over here, a lot of these teams... Um, have have started to step up the way they play into the game. If you look in uh, in the back, the the team scoring on the red right now into the uh, into the lander is eighty one hundred three Null Robotics, and they are dominant this year. Um, honestly, I think one of either the best or the second best team um, coming out of Washington. Uh, only Technova, I think, is is very comparable. And these guys, they have a very interesting robot. Um, uh, they they have a very unique scoring mechanism. I feel um, like by, with this arm, at least what I from what I've from what I've seen in my personal experience, I know a lot of teams now have this kind of thing. Um, but as you can see, they have a very short robot. The the robot does is able to go under the crater when fully uh, when fully flat, and um, they only collect blocks. They actually have a hard cap of two blocks. Even if they collect a single ball or if they collect more, it just actually just comes out of their intake mechanism very naturally. So that prevents them from having to really figure things out in the crater and they also have a um a double sample in autonomous um so super interesting stuff really dominant team but on the other side we have another very very um powerful team 89 23 we had um we had perpetual velocity and perpetual velocity um those guys also had a, a scoring mechanism that could uh, that that was was an arm based scoring mechanism, um, and these guys were they they played well as well. One of the most one of the most interesting things about them is how how um, how brave they were. I guess is the word um, to to get into their hang. They were hanging with like ten seconds left, even five seconds left, um, just getting off the ground as that buzzer hit, um, which I believe really did help their scoring capability. But unfortunately. Um, it wasn't enough for them to win that uh, for that for them to win that series. Um, so, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Quick question: uh, That event was at Amazon, right? 
That's right. It was at the Amazon headquarters. So what you saw in that video um, was actually an interleague qualifying tournament. So that's basically a league qualifier or a league championship. And if you if you observe the video, like the production quality was insane. Um, that's something I expected from super regionals, uh, not from league championships. So I really think that it was it was super cool how how much of a big deal um, Washington first wa and makes this and how they have the the support of their partners, um, the monetary support of their sponsors to do to host such a high quality event. Yeah, and I don't know if I, I saw a picture. I don't know if it was online. I know it was on Discord um, where there it looked like there were literally like spotlights on top of it, both of the fields. Um, and then from there, everything was like blacked out with like some cool like purple lighting. It was almost it was, it was like a sporting event. It seemed. That's right. That's right. That's what they did. And I think that yeah, first wa like always does like I don't know. I I've never expected something of that high quality for this level of tournament. But yes, they definitely did. Um, they put a lot of emphasis on the fields and on the teams. But one thing that I do want to mention about that is that um, I don't. I actually didn't ask around about this, but those kinds of spotlights could have problems with the sampling aspect of this game um because the teams are using computer vision software to do this um i don't think that i I don't think i personally don't think it would have helped too much that there were such bright blaring spotlights on the field um but i again i i actually don't know how it affected the competition because i wasn't there and i didn't ask around but um pretty cool stuff and i I gotta say yeah so something i want to mention quick uh washington interleagues are about as close as ftc currently has to a district system so they play two league meets, and every match from those league meets counts as their qualifying match like you normally play for league championships or their interleague competition. Well, so basically, yeah. every league meet matters, and every match at every league meet matters, which I like personally. Well, that that's an interesting take. Um, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't aware of that, but I know that every, uh, elsewhere, like, we have the 10 top uh, 10 top matches and then you get to like discard five or whatnot or how many ever uh, extra you have but i think that that, that has again it's both good and bad because for personally for my team um that would have been devastating if we had to um <laughs> if we had all of our matches count because we've had sort of a slow start to our season with our more like complex scoring mechanisms um but i think it definitely does um it does emulate the district system a lot more and that that could um that could pave the way i think for the future of ftc in terms of this type of competition yeah. all right so um next i want to move into the curie um the curie interleague tournament um this was a tournament uh with less than 21 teams and as such only had two team alliances um I uh, here I want to congratulate team 14294 the Nerdy Girls 2.0 and 12738 the Nerdy Girls for winning the tournament and 12005 G Prep Lightning and 6128 also G Prep Lightning for being finalists. So both the um, winning alliance and the finalist alliance were um, com- comprised of teams that were sister teams basically that worked together which I found pretty pretty interesting. Um in addition, congratulations to the Inspire Award winner, 8099 the Falcons, as well as the finalists of 9764 Eastmont High School and 7935 the Dragons 2.0. So now, um, moving on to Fe- Feynman. Uh, uh, correct me if there's anyone in chat uh, from Washington. I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, we're back to a larger tournament uh, with uh, three team alliances. And... Um, this interleague actually had a few well-recognized teams in the state of Oregon. I mean, sorry, Washington. <laughs> um, and uh, we had uh, uh, the winning alliance uh, was uh, comprised of the captain, 11120, the CPR Eagles. Um, this team, I believe, made it to the World Championships last year at Houston. And uh, so they were they were a pretty dominant team then. They were pretty, pretty good. And I believe they are um, they're once again a force to be reckoned with. Um, and their alliance partners, uh, their first pick was 8626, the Chicken Natives, Chicken Natives, and 12894, um, uh, I wasn't able to capture their name, uh, as their alliance partners. Um, so 13, uh, and then uh, 13074, uh, West, uh, West Sound Academy was the finalist alliance captain, picking teams 15468, and uh, 11970, Titanium Talons, to round out their alliance. Um, Congratulations to 11970, the Titanium Talons, for taking home a silver gold with their Inspire Award win as long as, as, as well as their finalist alliance. Also, good job, Team 
two O and um, uh, fifteen six four nine dynamics for Inspire nominations. All right, so um, now let's uh, let's move on to the um, second to last uh, division over here, uh, the Pasteur uh, Interleague Tournament. The Pasteur Interleague uh, was uh, home to some really good teams, arguably some of the best of the West. Um, uh, I've also I believe they were the only uh, interleague tournament that was international. There were some teams from Canada, or I believe there was a team from Canada that came in from there. Um, so uh, as uh, as the winning alliance captain of this tournament, we had none other than last year's World Championship winning alliance second pick. Um, uh, 12611 Technova, arguably, again, one of the most dominant teams in the state and the West Coast. Uh, uh, along with them, we had team 12809 Matt SB and 13330 Pulsar. On the finalist lines, we had team 15070, the Master Blasters, picking up 9915 Robo Thunder, the finalist alliance captain of the 2017 Houston World Championship, as well as team 2856 Tesseract. Um, all very, very well-known teams. Um, sorry? Oh, my bad. Um, so, um, in, in addition to them, uh, I would like to I would like to consider uh, I would like to uh, congratulate Technova Team One Two Six One One for a wonderful gold gold win at this tournament, winning the Inspire Award as well as winning Lions Captain there. So, um, good job to you guys. As well as, I'd like to congratulate Team Thirty Nine Fifty uh, Thirty Four Ninety One Fix It out of Victoria, BC, Canada, um, the international team I was talking about, who was the Inspire Award winner of the Twenty Seventeen World Championships, um, who won Inspire second place here at Washington State. And rounding that out, um, congratulations to Tesseract, who was the Inspire Award finalist in the 2017 World Championships as well. So one of the most surprising developments of this tournament were um, was the fact that there were a few teams that didn't advance. One of the most uh, prime, one of the most um, one of the most controversial teams that didn't uh, that didn't advance was 4042 non-standard deviation non-standard deviation was famously known last year for their for the bot that split in two parts um they were they were very very dominant with their innovative strategies last year and this year with their into uh, intuitive ball drive which was omnidirectional and was very able to um cross over uh, any kind of field element that was in play as shown by this video over here so it was very disappointing to see this team not make it past their league championship or their interleague tournament to states um, you guys are always in our hearts, and we'd love to see what you guys come up with um, in the future. I would love to see these innovative designs. So, I'm not, did, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm just gonna jump in. Did they use ball drive this year in competition? They, actually, they did use ball drive in competition this year. I'm not sure about their win loss record, but um, they actually were using this the drivetrain shown in this video um, to to uh, for for relic recovery. I mean, rover ruckus. Um, yeah, and the other team that was um, the other team that was missing that we we sort of missed from this uh, from the awards slash advancement was team thirty two thirty one, um, known for uh, being quite quite good in in the quite good this season. Actually, they set one of the Washington records with Technova. I believe we covered that match in uh, in the previous FTC recap that we did two weeks ago. So very disappointed to see these teams not moving on, but um, we'll see what the rest of uh, the rest of this this interleague has has in store as we go into the Washington State Championships. Um, good luck to these teams in future seasons. And last but not least, I'd love to round out with the Watt Interleague Tournament. Here, we had Team 5446, Clausistancy, 6559, Geared Reaction, and 11477 on the winning alliance, as well as 5961, Sound Robotics, 11121, FBI, and 5971, BrainBots on the finalist alliance. This is the only. Uh, this was actually the only interleague in Washington where the entire finalist alliance was able to advance due to overlap. So um, that's actually pretty exciting for these teams. Um, in addition, Team sixty five fifty nine Geared Reaction was able to take home that gold gold with the Inspire Award. Kudos to them. Also, congrats to Team one one four seven seven Four Eyes and fifty six zero four Thunderbots for Inspire Noms. Fifty six zero four is a name I have not seen in a long time, but I'm super excited to see what they have in store. All right, uh, and as Ethan said in the chat, uh, that is a super awesome ball drive. We're going to move uh, from the West Coast. And we're going to travel to my uh, lovely area of the Midwest where the first in Michigan FTC State Championship took place this past weekend. So I was at that tournament, and it was probably the best 
run and highest production tournament I've been to in quite a while. Um, there were two divisions with 48 teams per division, so 96 teams total at the tournament. Prior to the tournament, the high score had been set by an alliance at the Oxford qualifier in Michigan in the semifinals at Oxford. Uh, then at the state tournament, though, the high score was being beaten over and over and over again until the number one seeded alliance in the Edison division scored 442 points in semifinal one, match one. Uh, so quite an impressive event overall. Um, and if you guys want a full recap, that's going to be more than this, like 10 minute recap. Um, go check out our YouTube channel probably sometime next week as uh, we're going to have a bunch of bits and pieces from the recap that I did um, when I was live at the Michigan State Tournament. So awards wise, the Inspire winner at the tournament was 10-255 Robo Ducks. And the second and third place teams were 6134 Black Frogs and 8646 Team Chaos, respectively. So there were a lot of great teams that won awards, but we actually don't have the time and we actually don't have the full list of awards. I actually, during this show, um, Afera that you can see in the chat sent me the Inspire winners because they're not on the Orange Alliance yet. Um, so let's jump in to. We're going to talk about three uh, awesome matches that were at the tournament. So let's jump into Franklin qualification match 56. This match is the second highest scoring match overall and is the highest qualification match so far this year, according to the Orange Alliance. So in this match, we saw 86-46, Chaos, and 10-6-15 in the Blue Alliance versus 13-4-17 and 52-91 on the Red Alliance. The Blue Alliance won 42-4-7... <laughs> 427 to 191. I uh, can't speak. All right, so let's jump into this match. So after the autonomous period, we saw a perfect 162-point auto from the Blue Alliance. Um, we saw Chaos and their alliance partner maxing out auto, plus, uh, I believe, Chaos every single match um, intakes the mineral that they go to sample. So then they just dump it in the zone, in the depot for an extra two points. It's a pretty great strategy. You're always two points up if the other alliance got a perfect auto. Um, so Chaos, the robot that I'm talking about, is in the back um, left. So I can't say <laughs> too much about them outside of their amazing robot. They just work. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have anything to say about this match, but um, they literally always go in that uh, zone, the crater zone right in front of the uh, lander and they just go back and forth back and forth back and forth constantly uh, dumping in blocks and balls uh, one of the interesting things is I don't believe they have a sorting mechanism I, actually I know they don't have a sorting mechanism we did an interview with them on Saturday and all that is there is rubber bands uh, that just spin intake blocks or balls and um, that dump it out into the lander surprisingly it works so well and they haven't broken a lot of rubber bands they told me um, rubber band intakes are, are something that have been in FTC and primarily in Vex for like years. They're really awesome. Yeah, totally. I think that rubber band intakes um, they they made more of a pr uh, like a prominence. They they've gotten gained more prominence like now, like this year. Um, I've noticed that most teams in FTC at least always go for the surgical tubing flappers uh, rather than them. But this year, I really am seeing a lot of these um these rubber bands. So pretty pretty interesting stuff, and it's nice to see how the dynamic is changing. Yeah. Um. And we're now going to take a look at Edison semifinal. Uh, match one, or semifinal one, match one, which is the current high score overall in FTC and the highest score in an elimination match. So in uh, this match on the number one Red Alliance was comprised of 13 9, 17 Hillside Robotics, 53 33 CSPA Miners, and 13009 Techno Box. Uh, 83 50, or sorry, 85 33 was by far the most dominant, and most effective robot at the Michigan State Tournament. Uh, and that will be seen pretty evidently here in this match. Um, on the blue lines, we have teams 10091 Clarkson Robo Wolves, 11394 Pixelbotics, and 12068 Team Kraken. So here's the match. And we see that both of the alliance, actually, Tyler, could you skip back to the uh, end of Autonomous? Or, um, so, yeah, right there. So, the blue lines is down 20 points there. Uh, this is a common theme that I saw at the um, Michigan tournament 
is that every single good alliance would max out autonomous. Uh, so you would always get the 160. Sometimes you'd get 162. I wouldn't count on the two though. And every team would max, every good alliance would max out end game. And the only differentiator in these uh, really competitive matches was uh, what we're seeing right now was 85-33, what they're doing. They literally don't move. Similar to Chaos, though, 85-33 is so much more um, efficient and they're so much quicker at doing what they're doing, mainly because they don't turn around. As, uh, as we'll see in Franklin Finals 2, which we're going to watch in a moment, um, Chaos really has to turn around every single time, and that's grossly inefficient in my uh, opinion. That's one of their uh, flaws compared to 85-33. One thing that I think about 8533 is that while their robot might work now, the second a team realizes what they're doing, uh, like traversing the entire zone, um, and starts contacting them, their season's over, or their season's going to have a massive hindrance. Um, they're, they're operating under the assumption that like teams are too self-absorbed right now. They're, um, teams are only focusing on what they can do, um, and like they're going to sort of ignore them, uh, ignore 8533, and which is true, um, as you can see by this match, like as evidenced by the match, it's, uh, like there is no contact happening, but as soon as it team sees this it's a viable strategy for them to simply stay on 85 33 for the entire match and uh um, rack up some really um significant penalties yeah um i was thinking about that throughout the tournament though as soon as you go to do that what they have five seconds to move if i'm correct that's very so, true and they're less than five seconds their cycles are less than five seconds so. so they'll totally move within five seconds they probably will even just like back into their zone for a few seconds to let the robot cross and when you go to do that if the blue lines robot were to do that, you're just not scoring yourself. So it's just, it's that, uh, it's that payoff in that That's you're really not going to force the penalty points and you're just going to lose time yourself. This game is all, as I noticed in Michigan, this game is a hundred percent about time. How okay. fast can you cycle? Because at, I'm going to stress this again, at these competitive levels, all that you're going to see is maxed out autonomous is maxed out end game. And the only differentiator is what occurs during the usually a minute and uh, 50 seconds. Teams usually hang within the last 10 seconds. Um, Michigan was just an awesome event. And the biggest thing is that um, surprises me or just interests me is these are middle schoolers. That's middle true. That's very true. <laughs> have the top, I think, five or six highest scores in FTC so far. Mm -hmm. yeah, We're getting very... our butts beat by seventh graders. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Um Come on, high schoolers, do better. Um, no, it's just impressive to see. Um, does anyone have anything to say about that match? I, I just think it was a clean match. That I like, in my opinion, I think it's just they played the game as like I think one of the comments mentioned, right? It's like, hey, you just got to play the game as it's supposed to be played. That's exactly what happened here, and I think I think that that has its a lot of merits, right? There's no like, there's no business, there's no like, st like there's no like. Um, bad things happening is just you're playing the match, you're playing, you're you're doing your cycles as efficiently as possible, and whoever has better cycles wins. And I think that that was super underrated and very cool to watch. Yeah, totally. Um, I think we're now gonna we're gonna go deeper into the finals to check out the Franklin Finals match two. We're just oh, watching. and one thing, real quick. Um, yep. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's a reason why seventh graders and eighth graders are better, um, as according to Ilan or. Il Elon, Elon, um, it's that uh, we have college apps and we have stuff to do. So um, <laughs> you got to let's uh, let's chill out a bit. All right. Or you're just super that's lazy. That's oh, well, that's that's fair, too. Well, we we prepared for this show in the last show right through college <laughs> app season. So <laughs> guess we're not that lazy. Um, so we're, <laughs> we're going to go deeper in the finals to check out Franklin finals match two. So in this match, we saw the number six alliance in blue comprised of 8435 Twisted Metal, 7138 Mechanical Mayhem, and 5289 Martians facing off against the number one alliance comprised of 8646 Team Chaos, 7023 Hexasonics, and 9819 Robo So as I said before, 8646 is probably one of my favorite teams in the Franklin uh, division. I really like their ability to score minerals fast. Uh, they Definitely did cause a lot of chaos. Ha, ha, ha. I'm so cringe. Um, with their fast scoring mechanism, uh, though, as I said, their one downside is they have to turn around. So we're going to see this play out right here, right now, in the bottom right corner of this match. Um, I don't think they did not have a perfect autonomous period. I think they missed a, a sample in this match. Um, but that did not matter. 
because they go to score away, but we're going to see every single time they got to flip around. They do have a super fast drive train as I will admit. Nathan, can I ask, why is it so hard for so many other FTC events to have a camera angle like this? Like this seems like this is the easiest, stupidest solution to have a full field view of something. And yet it's completely impossible for 95% of events to do this. I don't understand it. It's very true. Um, like FTC, uh, like in general, um, production quality is, uh, is a bit lower. Um, but I got to say the massive leaps. This, and this is a happen. webcam though. Like literally a webcam <laughs> set up in front of the wow. field. All you have to do is say, Hey people don't get in front of the camera. It's not that well, hard. This is a $1,300 camera here. Yeah, actually. But you could use, uh, a, no, you no, could you use a, a webcam camera yes. and be just fine. Yes, I know. Um, I, I think what Shishir might've been saying is one of the, I think we're, we're getting there. We started with live scoring this year. Um, well, that's a 1300 hour camera. Why is it so blurry in the upper right hand corner? <laughs> Uh, ask the FIM guys. Alex, do you want to defend your cameras? Um, so, so, sorry, I just got distracted. Um, I think we're, FTC is getting there in terms of production quality. We, I've seen more events streamed this year um, than in any other year. And with live scoring, it's great. We'll, we'll get there, Tyler. People will learn. But when you start doing live stream for the first year, no one figures it out. I mean, yeah. we've just kind of been watching this as we've been talking over uh, I did forget that the Blue Alliance won this match, uh, but oh. still. Or no, 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 no they <laughs> no, didn't. Wait, Sorry. No, hang. Sorry, they were just, the hangs had not been counted yet. You're right. I don't know. I, um, I felt dumb for a second, but I guess I'm not dumb. Um, yeah, Chaos just killed it there. They're, I think the best hero with this event, even though, or Chaos was an Alliance captain, uh, but um, 85-33 wasn't. I think those are the two best robots. Um it's it's amazing. It's just it's incredible to watch. I'm surprised at this early. I'm surprised, but I'm not surprised at this early in the season. We have such competitive play like this. Uh, anything else to add, Shishi or Ethan? Uh, yeah, I, I I'm I'm very shocked by the amount of compet like how the high level of competition at this stage of the game, especially for such a hard game, um, it really shows that FTC teams as a whole, like as a conglomerate, are getting a lot better. Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> Um, I feel like, like, so I did some math, um, and cycle times, if you compare them this year to last year, are pretty similar right now. Um, there are some really high-end teams getting, like, average seven-second cycles, which was about the pretty high-end for late December last year as well. So I think, I think teams are about the right level. I think Michigan is the place where a lot of those teams are together. A lot of the times, early season, you have a lot of really good teams who are really scattered. And there aren't a lot of events with multiple really good teams together. So I think that's why it feels a little less competitive this year. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I would agree with that. Yeah. But, um, oh, sorry. You, you go, Shishir. Yeah, but, but one thing that I did notice, like, bring it back to the point that you said about how the cycle times between this year and last year are uh, similar. Uh, I totally agree with that. But then if you take it one year prior, right? The cycle times have massively decreased from Velocity Vortex, right? Like, so I think that that, um, like how like first has been designing the games, um, I think it's underrated just how good they're, um, how, uh, just how well they're sort of predicting the level of play that's going to go on and sort of changing the game to make it, um, make it, uh, make it, uh, still challenging for these teams. Like, yes, last year was sort of easier, I believe, but I think they really hit their stride with this year's game. Yeah, I really like um, how this game is going to evolve for championships, especially just due to the fact that um, we got like two creators. And I think that um, there's going to be a lot of strategy on where the teams get the, the minerals from in future events. Like that's going to be really, really exciting to watch. Absolutely. Um, I've been pinged actually three times on Discord and now once in the chat. <laughs> uh, I. I've been told to mention that at the first in Michigan State tournament, one of the cool and interesting things is that there were eight team alliances. So um, that meant there were quarterfinals, semifinals, and then finals. So it was just a unique event in that uh, we had a second, another round of playoffs. So there you go, Alex. Are you happy? I mentioned it. Um, <laughs> it's interesting because it has doubled, which does make second picks a little less competitive. Yeah, but it allows for a lot more teams in elimination matches. Is but it a serpentine draft, or is it um, one through no. eight, one through eight, one through eight, eight through one? Oh, got it, got it. Okay. 
Um, and then one of the things I want to talk about, I know we're really running out of time, so I'll make this super quick, is I'm going to go back to that defense thing. I drew this during the show, by the way. Um, <laughs> defense is amazing, and I think every team should play defense. There's a thread about the defense. Oh, shoot, I didn't even mention it. Or oh, Actually, we didn't end up watching that match because we ran out of times. But there was one match, uh, there was one team in the Michigan State tournament where uh, someone would sit in the crater and then you'd kind of just go back. They would just literally go back and forth within the crater. And that's all they would do. They would just go back and forth and get in the way of other teams. That's a perfectly legal thing to do. Someone on Reddit is kind of complaining about it. Uh, but I would say just get used to defense, guys, because uh, it's great. And I forgot to mention in our uh, great conversation that in that last finals match we saw, there were two cup bots. They literally were cups. They just went down on top of the balls, only balls though. And then they'd go up and drop them or they'd flip the other way and drop them. It was almost like a golf ball, tennis ball, picker upper. Oh, the ball shaggers. Yes. Ball, we, had ball those shaggers. Through, yeah. we had those in uh, what's it called? Cascade effect. I believe oh, that was a pretty nice strategy that year too. There was an Oregon team that did it pretty well that year. Yeah. Oh, and, and that team from Washington in velocity vortex. Huh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember that. So yeah, there, there was some very unique things that happened at the Michigan State Tournament, some unique defense, some unique balls or uh, cups. It was interesting that the two cup bots at the tournament ended up on the same alliance. Oh. <laughs> I like this play, right? Guess you want to play with people that are similar to you? That's right. I, don't know. <laughs> I guess it's cup bot meta. You know? Cup bot meta, yep. I actually haven't so, seen those robots, so I, I'm I'm really looking forward to get a get a solo cup sponsorship. Thanks, Nate. That's, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Okay. So thank you guys for all the follows and subscriptions we received today. Don't forget that you can subscribe for free if you or your parents have Amazon Prime. We hope you guys enjoyed this episode of FTC Recap. If you want to stay connected with what first updates now. FTC is doing. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at FunFTC, and join our Discord through the link in the chat. Um, before I finish, uh, someone, Sammy Soapsticks asked about shooting. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I've not seen a bot this year that's shot balls or minerals. How about you guys? <laughs> Hi. I saw, oh, you guys do. <laughs> oh, I, I saw not one in Mexico. I'll admit and that it didn't work <laughs> like i actually saw videos of them like practicing that it worked and it, it's kind of like you see the robots so well in videos of practice and they're like yeah we're really excited for the reno you look at them at the reno and they're like doing absolutely nothing i'm like where's your shooter it's not calibrated and i'm like okay <laughs> Well, so um, I do want to create, uh, again, we, we are running out of time. I'll create a very quick quick clarification for this. Um, shooting by itself, yes, is illegal. What, no, what it's we're not doing. illegal, right? You can be in the zone and shoot, right? It's that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yes. It's, yeah. Uh, but, like, it has a lot of restrictions. The thing that we're doing, Revamped, is um, we're actually popping. We're, uh, we're using a cam-based um, launching mechanism, um, completely enclosed with tubing, similar to um, similar to my, my old team, my rookie team, actually, 87-16, in a cascade effect, where we basically have the balls in our robot, have, have the balls and blocks, pop it to the top of our robot, and then dump from there. So that's basically the way that we're approaching the game. Um, but... Um, yeah, it's it's very interesting. It'll be pretty interesting to see how it works out. Well, good luck to you, and uh, thank you, Turbocharge, uh, for supporting us with some giveaways. Um, you're welcome for mentioning 8533. I can't say thank yous all day, but so on behalf of myself, Ethan, Shishir, Lino, and our producer, Tyler, working behind the scenes, I would like to thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, so this is our last show of the year, so thank you all very much to everyone who supported us over the last nine months. Can't believe it's nine months since we started um, Fun FTC. So I know that Ethan and I really appreciate all of your support helping make this show happen and in helping grow Fun FTC. So cheers to 2018. Um, and let's hope for an even better 2019. Uh, so coming up show wise, um, and so does Shishir. Sorry, <laughs> Shishir appreciates it as well. He's been on most of our shows. Uh, so coming up show wise will be an interview with a vendor drum roll that vendor will be go build a so including some sweet giveaways that you will not want to miss if you watch live uh then we're going to go to try and get some top teams to come on ftc live to talk about their robot and their season so far and then we've got a lot more of ftc rehab to come to cover the great 
uh, events that have been happening in January, February, and March. So happy holidays to everyone. Have a great new year and stay tuned for our next show. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent. Pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now.